Uh, well, first of all, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Uh, I thought maybe we'd start off by talking about your various festival experiences. Maybe start with uh, your first film, uh, which was My Dog Vincent, which is 90... 98, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to... Uh... Well, Steve's smiling because he knows it got rejected by TIFF, so my... my... <laughs> I thought we'd start with rejection, because I think it's a common thing that everyone can relate to. And so I really handled it well. I was working as a journalist at the time, and I wrote this sort of scathing article, Why, why I Hated TIFF. Uh... <laughs> It was a good piece, actually. It was very well written, not bitter at all. Uh, so we we <laughs> debuted at the uh, at the Montreal World Film Festival, and it was like it, the marketplace was completely different at the time. But it was it was the right, not the right thing, but it's it sort of had a great little life after played all over the place, and then still occasionally on CBC late night where you're like, oh Jesus, turn the channel very quickly. But <laughs> but it, I mean, I think uh, I, I frankly I wouldn't counsel people on writing lengthy articles about not having your film accepted no i wouldn't either that was especially this day and age <laughs> yeah uh, back then it was cool though that was the 90s i think it was a different thing there was no internet where it's always existing i don't think it actually exists anymore in, online but i don't know um maybe i mean well we actually my dog vincent actually had votes for best canadian film too i think i remember and um, on one of our polls so. yeah i mean the thing about like when i look about back in that film and we were ridiculously proud of it we made it at the time for one hundred fifty thousand dollars when it was in 35 millimeter and it was pretty ambitious and that was really my i didn't go to film school or anything like that and i was sort of using the kevin smith model the brother or the brothers mcmullen that will take over the world and uh, really kind of believed it but it was a good in the end like all our investors made money it was a good launching pad for the rest of the stuff that i i, I eventually did um so it, it did what i needed to do but sort of not at the time if that makes any sense yeah. Um, did it go? Did you take it to other festivals as well, or did you just? Yeah, use we Montreal went to Sudbury. Went to the Atlantic Film Festival. Uh, I think that was it. I think three film festivals and um, a distribution company that uh, Oasis International picked it up. They sold it. The, the sales were great on it for because not a ton of films were being made at that time. So if you got one made, they could usually sell it. So the the sales were great. And I I, I sort of. It was interesting. I, I sort of went into it thinking everybody will recognize my genius and the offers will come flooding in. And it didn't work that way. It's, still, it's always a hustle. I remember hearing uh, David Cronenberg speak on Q a couple months ago saying like, it's always a hustle. Like you're always trying to hustle your next film. So I think that if I learn one thing from that, it's not sort of going to – like people are, are going to recognize maybe that you have talent, but it's not just going to be – here you have talent, and here's the money for, or here's the offer. It would be good if that's the way it worked, but I still probably not. Yet. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, you, didn't you won a prize in the Atlantic? Didn't Vincent win a prize at the Atlantic? I don't think so. Well, it should have. Uh, maybe it did. I don't know. I mean, it was my mother. Uh, that's favorite, the way I remember. My mother's favorite <laughs> film of her children's. <laughs> cool. I wish it did, but it didn't. Um, and. Uh, so after that, you followed up with St. Ralph, which was what? 2004. So I didn't, at 98, and I really, uh, I just, I really was stupid. Like, I just thought it was all going to fall, like I said, it's going to all fall in place, and it really didn't. I thought, okay, I'll get an agent, and it'll just be magical. And I sort of took these bad steps of just not, like, the thing that got my dog Vincent made was just, like as I said, hustling and just sort of believing in it and doing it. And then nothing happened and then I sort of then started hustling again did a kid show and then when I was doing a kid show St. Ralph came together and it was you sort of go from doing a $150,000 film to like a six point I think it was about 6.1 million and it, it sort of it doesn't really make any logical step that you get the breaks that you do or you don't get the breaks that you do uh, and it's sort of like well okay now I'm you know now I'm a director doing bigger films but not really legitimately so it just I kind of got some breaks that made it happen. Did you, how did, how did you approach, I mean, like well, that's I a mean, huge the, increase in the budget. Did that like completely freak you out? Or was it like, well, I remember, I remember Adam McGoin actually told me a story once where he said, uh, um, uh, when he made the adjuster, he had like one point, like everything else had been largely council grants, like right. uh, family viewing and next of kin. And uh, I think even speaking parts, uh, but with the adjuster, he had 1.7 million and he looked and it's like, how am I going to spend all that money? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, they had real adults in charge of that one. It was certainly not me. I mean, I think the, I think the, the thing about any of my films or any of the breaks I've got, it's always come from the script. Like the only, I mean, I, my dog Vincent allowed me to be a director, even though it was complete sort of bullshit in some ways, like lots of people 
do a low budget film. That doesn't mean you could do a bigger budget film. And I didn't really feel like a director. I felt like a pretender. I remember the tech survey. They said, oh, we have a tech survey next day. I was like, oh, this will be interesting. And, you know, it's a bus with 50 people on it. <laughs> and you sort of have to explain where your shots are going. You're like, I don't know. We're going to point the camera here. Uh, but it really was the script that people responded to. And I think they felt like if this idiot could write the script, maybe he could direct it. So they loved the script, and therefore, doors opened easier. It wasn't sort of like, we love his visual style for my dog, Vincent. That's why we wanted him to be this. And so when you went to St. Uh, St. Ralph, had its world premiere at TIFF. Yeah, it was... Uh, um, you, I think you did AFM, or like some market screenings prior to, maybe? No, we, uh, we didn't. We, it was an interesting experience. Uh, so we, we really felt like it was going to be, like, you know, we, in this bubble that, oh, it's a great film, we think we're geniuses again. And I remember reading the first review in Now magazine, and it was St. Ralph does not belong, not that I'm bitter or remember, but St. <laughs> Ralph does not belong in a film festival or a theater. I'm like, wow, that's, I, don't, I don't see any, I'm not sure I can even read between the lines anything good in there. And I read two, two more that were just as brutal. Like, we were getting slammed. The first three reviews were brutal. Like, at full stop, just like, holy f***. Uh, I guess this is being taped, but whatever. Uh, we, we can bleep that, right, Christoph? Uh, this time you didn't have to edit me. So. And I was like, I was so nervous. Like, I was just like, my back was tense. I remember sort of... You know, we, it was uh, Alliance of the Lance at the time. Then they did a big job of it. Was at the Ryerson. It was a, it was a, it was a, a Canada First section. Yeah, I had I, opened the first Canada First section. Yeah, exactly. And the TIFF had done a great job of sort of positioning it and making sure people knew about the film. We had sales agents from uh, William Morris, and we had somebody else from New York selling the film. This is all done not through me, but through Alliance of the Lance and, and stuff like that. And and the screening was one of these fantastic screens that you can only dream of. That, you know, it, it was a 10 minute standing ovation. And I remember walking up after the screening, like to do the QA. And I'm saying, I think that went well because I'm so out, of, I'm so tense, I can't even tell. And she's like, What do you want them to throw money at you, sort of thing? I was like, Well, actually, it wouldn't be bad. Uh, and, we, <laughs> and, we, and we went on to, so, and, and the way that film was set up was really sort of a rousing conclusion to, like, it sort of had this emotional lift that people sort of, if they liked the film, they wanted to clap. And, you know, and, and it ended up selling all over the place. Like, the guy that sold it also sold Garden State. He's like, this is doing better than Garden State. They sort of sold, I don't know, three or four million dollars around the world. So we had this kind of legendary, great festival experience. You know, I got agent, agents signed me up. All this kind of stuff was happening, and it was great. And then sort of it felt like everything else is a bit of a letdown after that. Like, it didn't quite do as well as the, at the box office we wanted in Canada. And then it, and it sort of eventually came back. By the time we got to Japan to do press, the Japanese liked it. <laughs> sort of like, it sort of came around to, oh, this is good again. But it was kind of funny thinking like TIFF was the high point in some ways for a long time. And I kind of thought, again, oh, it's all going to be magical because I've got these now agents in, in the States and stuff like that. And certainly stuff came about, of it, but I again realized it was just, it was the hustle. Like when we showed one week at TIFF, we had a sales agent, but and it was a gal, and it was big, but our, like Josh Jackson had visa problems. He couldn't get in town. It was a rainy night. And it, the film, because it's a different kind of film, didn't go over like I thought it would compared to St. Ralph. Like everywhere I went with St. Ralph at the festival, people stood up and clapped. People were kind of depressed at the end of one week, but I still wanted to clap. I wanted to ask him, do you really like the film? Like, and it, that sort of was... Or they could have just thrown money. So, but again, that was a bit deflating, but then that went on to have this fantastic life in Canada. So it was sort of like, it, it was interesting, two different experiences. And was it, I mean, it was like, obviously there's different types of, uh, uh, you know, some screening houses, some theaters work better for other film, for some films more than others. I mean, the Ryerson was actually, I was there at that screening. My mother was too. She, she loved the movie. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a real mother's movie. Uh, LAUGHTER it, uh, yeah, I mean, Roy Thompson Hall comes with, obviously, a gal comes with expectations, comes with a bit more pressure and, and hype and red carpet and all that kind of stuff. After that, we felt it had played well, and, but we weren't, I was, I was definitely not sure what it was going to do. So it was, it was completely different than St. Ralph. After St. Ralph, we, we knew it worked, but I wasn't quite sure after, after one week. But it did, it did quite well at the box office. Yeah, yeah, it did great at the box office. It was one of the highest grossing ones. And um, yeah, and it's continued to have this nice little life. Like I was, because I was writing this application for the producer's thing. And it was, it's the, the highest rated Canadian film on, on iTunes for some strange reasons. It had a Slumdog Millionaire, which I don't really know why. Way to go. I know. Yeah. <laughs> 
the uh, um, so d just to backtrack a bit. I mean, obviously, um, when when you went in with one week, was it the same sort of uh, like team that you had together? I mean, you had like you had pretty hefty, uh, some pretty substantial uh, sales agents working on on Saint Ralph. It was. Cassian Elways uh, yeah, uh, from William Morris, who's one of the most successful, and yeah. uh, um, Rita Ronson and Andrew yeah. Hurwitz out of uh, yeah, uh, yeah. We had uh, Charlotte Mickey was uh, selling uh, f uh, one week, and Mongrel was distributing. So we things were in place, sort of how it would roll out and stuff like that, and they did a good job with it. You're, and you're, we weren't in that time because for one week we weren't releasing till the spring. We weren't. We knew we were going to release in the spring, so I wasn't really doing any media or anything like that. It was just keep a low profile and hopefully we get some sales and stuff like that. And the international sales for one week were not nearly as good as St. Ralph. I mean, the industry had changed. We certainly we sold to IFC in the states and we sold around the world, but it wasn't kind of like like in for St. Ralph. I think we had five offers from Japan even before the festival. They said Japan's not buying. Like we're not like we're not hoping like. They're not buying these type of films. So it was sort of did, did the market had collapsed in Japan. Uh, so you just go on with different expectations. And I mean, even with the fact that uh, obviously the cast was a little more high powered and uh, um, was one week, it doesn't really guarantee stuff. Or well, certainly got, more recognizable. We got lucky with one. I mean, that Josh, when we, when, when Josh Jackson, um, when we hired Josh, he wasn't, not much was going on. We really got lucky with Fringe and, you know, uh, so that kind of helped us a lot. Uh, but the marketplace had changed. Like, it, it sort of those days of, you know, like even, you know, the announcements that come out of TIFF or Sundance or Can, like those sort of multiple, you know, announcements of deal after deal after deal. Like, you see movies that have high profile stars that are, you know, I don't know how much the budget are, the budget is, and you're like, that thing didn't sell. Like, that sells a, a month after, after, after a festival is, is surprising to me. So less of a frenzy and a, probably a smaller price, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. I would think so. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's more of a. It's more groundwork. It seems like. How, what was your festival? Uh, what were What was the festival strategies for uh, Saint Ralph? You did. You said. Well, we went across. We did all the Canadian festivals. I th most of them, I think, and then we. Uh, there was a lot more internationally that I didn't go to. We went to the Paris Film Festival, and we I, somehow the film won a, like a hundred thousand euros or something like that. So, which the distributor used. So we had big releases, sort of most of the major territories, and like I did stuff in France and I said Japan and stuff like that, and I did stuff in the states because we had a good release in the states. Um, so like we went to festivals in the sort of in the states and stuff like that. But for me. Like, I've got a wife and kids. I like going to, like, I, I'll go to the festivals if it's, an, especially the Canadian festival. I mean, TIFF's obviously, like, because it's a launching pad, like, it's not like I'll go to TIFF. It's like, you, you're, we're really excited to see how it goes to TIFF. But the other festivals in Canada, I enjoy going to them and I enjoy, like, I appreciate getting in and, and obviously supporting them as well because they've been, you know, because they've been good to me. And mm -hmm. But internationally, I don't tend to go to a lot unless I think, I'm, unless I think it's going to be a value, because it's it's like I think uh, Score got into the Tokyo Film Fest or something like that. And it was like a couple of days of travel. At, like it was just going to be a week, and I couldn't see the the value if I didn't sort of have any commitments at home. I would go for sure, probably. Yeah. And Score was obviously. I mean, that was easily the most high-profile opening. Opening the festival. How did, how did that? Uh, um, did was it a different type of preparation? Were you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We. <laughs> We didn't have a sales agent going in. We sort of wanted to roll the dice with it in that, you know, just figured the audience and stuff like that would, would dictate it. It could not, like the, it was an interesting thing. Like the opening couldn't have gone better. Like it was a great screening at Roy Thomas Hall, but we got a lot of flack from a lot of places, you know, from everything, well, how could TIFF program this to just people hated on the film. And you kind of realize, like I, I kind of felt like I've never been, I've always got good reviews, but I've never been. I've never felt like I've never felt like I'm the review darling at all. Like I, I get you know my share of negative reviews, and ironically, sort of of the big six sort of papers that you know this is pro score is probably my best reviewed film, but the sort of secondary ones I was getting slammed, almost for the fact that we I don't know it wouldn't say we opened the festival. But it's just it became higher profile, and I don't think it paid off for the film to be that high profile, even though I thought before it was. And, you know, it's such an honor to be, to open the festival. And I would never take away that night because it was just, 
it was a great. It was a pretty sensational it night. It was yeah. a great night, and we and it was just, but it, you know, you can't second guess anything. But I, I just I was surprised whether it was a tall poppy syndrome or whatever. I was surprised at how many haters were out there for a film that was a family, like it was made as a family film. So I don't know. Obviously the film sparked a lot more, you know, I mean, hockey was one of those things we never really dealt with either, right? I mean, there's a complete lack and there's been a couple since then, particularly Goon. Well, Goon, I mean, Goon's a great example. I mean, Goon goes out, it is, you know, it sort of takes the slap shot territory, makes, you know, tons of money at the box office. I mean, that's what we were hoping for and we didn't hit that. So, you know, you, you, you take your, you know, you take your shot and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So it's not like you sort of blithely, we had tons of support from everybody, from TIFF, from Telefilm, from Mongrel, from Cineplex. Like we were swinging for the fences on that one and unfortunately didn't work in the box office, but you know, life goes on. Um, did, um, I wanted to ask, I mean, uh, still uh, the new film uh, is again with Mongrel, and this is like I think the third straight yeah, the film third you've film, done yeah. with Mongrel. Yeah. How closely do you work with the distributor? I mean, you've been through it quite frequently, but I mean, how? how yeah, we work really like we have a good working relationship. Like we talk about things from everything to you know. I mean, obviously, you don't expect to get into TIFF. You hope to get into TIFF. Um, you pray to get into TIFF, sort of thing. And then, you know, where ideally would you like it in the festival? Where do you want to position it? what night, all that kind of stuff, you know, we work with as a distributor, assuming that they're going to like the film, first of all. And uh, and then, you know, I work, I mean, I'm t I, the publicist at Mongrel I've dealt with now for three films, we talk all the time. This is Bonnie. Bonnie, right? yeah. yeah. She's she's fantastic. And it's, it's there's a lot of, st like, naturally, especially if you've been through it a few times, you just sort of see, well, you're one of the filmmakers that they're going to they're gonna sort of note. So like like this morning something came like a request came to me and I, I just forward it to Bonnie and we strategize on everything from you know when like are we going to do pre screens or what and that's sort of in conjunction with Mongrel and in conjunction with the sales agent and it's really it's it's a strategy to try to see what's best for the film you know and I I remember with my dog Vincent like you know we beat the pavement to get you know to get attention for it and with you know when we have two oscar nominated actors and you've been through it a couple of times you're you're you, you can for you have the, the luxury of being a little bit more strategic about you know what you're trying to do and especially too because we're not we're not opening and you know we're not we're not re we're not re releasing theatrically right after the festival so we don't want to be you know really high profile during the festival it's just it's more of a how are you going to play it all out yeah, I mean, there's different types of strategies about how you want a festival to work. I, I think, uh, well, uh, St. Ralph was a well, that was released in the spring. Yeah, right? it was, yeah. So St. Ralph, one week, and and still were all released, you know, after. And score was right after. Yeah, so yeah. score, we were basically going to the opening of the parking lots to get attention. Like it was definitely, hi, here we are. Uh, no, we don't want you anymore. Like we, no, we were just, we we're definitely just trying to be more visible. Yeah. Um, do you find that's uh, um, is that a strategy that? Um, I mean, I, that's not necessarily a common strategy, right? To wait till to, to premiere in the fall and then and go in spring, but obviously. Well, it's, again, it's a discussion with a distributor. Like, what films do they have coming up? What do we think is best for the film? And I mean, you know, we're hoping for a U.S. sale. So, why would we want to then open in October, when without the backing of the or the yeah, if we, if we get US lucky and we release. get it, and we know that we're waiting till the spring has worked in the past, so it's not necessarily a detriment. So that's really why. You know, with Mongrel, it's fantastic because it's a conversation. It's not like we're going to – it's just a conversation. It's not a – nobody's right, nobody's wrong, but they they very much want to have the conversation and figure out what's right for the film ultimately. Yeah. What, um, what do you think people can actually expect from a festival or not expect from a festival? I think they're I, – I think everybody's experience is obviously going to be different. And, I mean, I'm in the same situation as everybody here because I'm coming with something new that I don't know what the reaction is going to be for it. So I think that if you manage your expectations, like I always look at the festival as like, okay, this could be the last time I'm here. Like this could be, you know, this could be it. So try to, definitely try to enjoy it. Try to, you know, try to make the most of it because you're in a unique position. Like, I mean, how many films were submitted and how many people got in? Like... Uh, about one in ten, I yeah, would say, so feature-wise. So we're all uh, it's, it's it's not that that ratio is not quite as high with shorts. It's I think it's one in five, maybe. But you're or one in fifteen. We've all beaten the odds to come here and or to get in, and so 
at least if you've always got your eye sort of on the next prize, which you kind of have to do because it is the hustle, you might miss just the fact that you, we've all got in and we can enjoy it for this might be it. Like we all might be, you know, it wasn't that great in 2012. Jeez, I should have been. But, and I think that, the, <laughs> no, but seriously, like, well, like you know, there's no, no guarantee any of us are going to be able to make another film. Uh, and I also think that the people that really are in your face are just annoying as hell. Like it, like you gotta figure out a way. Everybody has to figure out a way to, you know, me, me, me. Look at me. And I think that a lot of, you know, everybody's inundated with stuff during the, especially during the festival. So, you know, if you can just keep moving stuff through, you probably have a better chance three weeks after the festival to say, you know, you look at my short online, or here's a screener, or whatever, or your feature, or whatever if they're sort of tracking, you know, the films with the higher profile films and stuff like that. And especially, too, if your film comes to the festival under the radar, which er a film, you know, or 10 does every festival, gets fantastic reviews, has a great screening, then you're, you could be away to the races. But I do think the process is, is much longer now than it was in the past for big films and little films. Do you, do you um at a, do do you bring scripts to the festival? Do you can schedule meetings? Do I remember you? I remember before I had a film a script a film at the festival. I was like stalking uh, Quentin Tarantino, like do I was like okay he's gonna be here, and really try to get out in the screenplay. And I got like in front of him, and he's just like scared. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I think it's I think you want to make a connection with somebody. I think it's so easy to email a screenplay that. I mean, I I wouldn't bring a screenplay to the festival and say. But you would you uh, does is it a good opportunity to meet people? Do you try to do I that or? I think that? so. I mean, you would know that better than I would. I mean, I, I sort of go in in a bit of a bubble because it's because your your time is sort of like my like it's my time is sort of programmed for me at the festival. If you know what I mean, like we we do this, we do that, we do some you know we'll do some press. It it sort of goes that way. You know, I mean, this time. I'll meet some agent. I haven't had an agent for about five years, so I'll meet you know an agent this time, a couple of agents that have expressed interest. That kind of stuff I'm happy to do, but it, it doesn't really feel like somebody would come to the festival looking for a director or looking for somebody, like say, I've got $5 million, I wanna make this movie, if I can just put the right pieces together. It just doesn't feel like it works that way. Yeah. You know, yeah. so as I said, if you've got the best script that's ever written, chances are you're gonna, it's going to get made. Cool. Do we? Does anybody have any questions, comments, um, thoughts? Anybody sleep? Anybody awake? I can't see anybody. Uh, anybody want to recount the plot of my dog Vincent? <laughs> um, yes, there. Anyone? Oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> If you could do it again, or what would your advice be to first-time feature filmmakers um, for the next year or two of their lives uh, about focusing on, and I, I brought this up earlier in the boot camp, focusing on the kind of talent, because uh, St. Ralph, other than Jennifer Tilly, right. or was it Meg, I can't, I can't no, remember. No, it was Jennifer, Jennifer yeah. Um, you know, d didn't have any recognizable talent, but well, from Campbell. what you're saying, um, it had it had the biggest legs in terms of giving you attention, but and then now you've gone on to make films that have you know recognizable talent in it. So I'm just wondering where would you put the the emphasis? What did you like doing more? What did you feel delivered more for you as to make your voice heard and people take notice? Well, I mean, Saint Ralph did have Gordon Pinson and did have Campbell Scott as well. So there were three. You know, I think the talent. I mean, if you can get somebody attached, if some if somehow you can get Brad Pitt attached, get Brad Pitt attached. But the reality is, no agent. Re I mean, they're gatekeepers, agents, managers. They don't. They they don't care unless the money is there. Like usually, when we're making offers, well, always when we're making offers to actors, it's a pay or play. Meaning, here's the money. If the film doesn't get made, you get the money, and that's kind of what most of them demand. Unless you have, you know, either a reputation or an in with them. So, if you're going to make a film for a ridiculously low amount of money, and it's a great script, I think you have a chance of getting a star. But you need that first. I mean, it's just hard to get to those people because they're not interested. Like, why would the agent of somebody that's recognizable say, 
I want to read this script that has no money attached and know that if their if their client gets attached, maybe they can get some money. Like it doesn't. It's probably not in their best interest. I'm not talking like the scales of Brad Pitt. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying like I'm, no. I'm just saying like any like any. But but if you have Brad Pitt, like I mean that's what people do. Like they know whoever it is. You know. I mean I'm not obviously using Brad Pitt, but whoever is in your fame meter that you know that you can get attached to it. If you can get them attached before, that's great. But I I just think it comes down to the script. Like I just I absolutely think once you have a good script you can make, you have a chance. If you don't have a good script, there's no chance whatsoever. There's a great, uh, a, a related story about casting. Uh, Jason Eisner did Hobo with the Shotgun, yeah. which is a kind of a parody, or it takes part, like it's a grungy cult movie, quite violent. Uh, they went in, um, and I think, I think it was Alliance who, uh, um, that was distributing the film, and they put some money up, and uh, uh, they basically said, well, who do you see playing the hobo? And it's like, well, you know, they had friends who'd been in the short version, and then and then they said, but, but you know, think about it, who would you really want? It's like, well, you know, obviously we'd love to have Rucker Hauer, but we'll never get him. And it's like, oh, yeah, we can ask Rucker Hauer. And then, you know, in the end, I mean, you don't have to, like, scale down all the time, right? No, and I, you know, if it's 50 million bucks, you're going to pay them the rate, your film. If it's $1.8 million or whatever your budget is, they'll... If they like it, they'll do it because you know they're not working all the time, and they might just take a flyer on it or whatever. So I don't. These days, I mean, I think talent will do all kinds of different things for all kinds of money, different money because they're interested. Yeah, but there's not necessarily a huge amount of ab absolutely fabulous scripts out there. Right? No, so. exactly. And anybody, anybody, you look at something like Beast of the Southern Wild that doesn't have anybody, no names, and just I mean, there's just many examples of films that have nobody in it that do great that. Uh, versus films that have actors that we know that bomb. Next. Anyone? Um, at the back, no? Anyone? There we go. Um, we, we have a mic. One is, um, do you m make time to see films at the festival, and is there a film that you're looking forward to see this year? And the other question is, um, do you have your next project in your back pocket? Uh... I don't usually make time. I've always want to make time to see films at the festival, but I haven't at all. So this is one of my commitments to try to do that this year. Uh, so we'll see if I, I do that. And I don't really know what the line of it, so I don't know. It's amazing how little films I see at the film festival. It's sort of like just, just you just go for your three days and, and then you're kind of completely burnt out. But I'm hoping to. Uh, my next project, there's a bunch of stuff I'm working on that, you know, that who knows, will go or not. <laughs> I'm always like throwing a, Kind of stuff against the wall to hope something sticks. I'm just terrified that nothing will. So, what, is it just tip that you don't go to see films at, or like you know, you you you? We were talking about Whistler because you, you. Yeah, had we a saw great films at, at Whistler. Yeah, we saw films at Whistler. Uh, I went out with my wife and saw films at Whistler. It's it tends to it's funny like like with score like we would it was so busy like we went to Calgary for the opening, and then we were like so we were the first film went to the party, got on the plane the next morning at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to Edmonton, went to Edmonton and left. So like, there was just no time to see films. So the last time, because we opened everything, there was really no, there was no, we didn't, there was no fil other films playing and we sort of, were, they kicked us out kind of early. I, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing films at the festivals this year, for sure. Like, like we're going to Sudbury uh, on the, I think it's the 21st of September. And you've been to see, well, we've, we're in the tent in Sudbury together, of course, when I first met you. And uh, that's a, a great pit party. It's a, that's a, there's, it's, I'll, I'll see some films there because you get there early and see a couple of films and have a good time. Where, where I find, because I, I live about an hour and a half outside of Toronto, I'm just sort of here for that time. And then it's harder for me to sort of just come in for an afternoon to see films and stuff. Is there, is it, um, obviously you have different expectations out of different festivals. I mean, do you... Uh, like when you go to a, a more like a festival that's not doesn't have the I mean TIFF is fairly large yeah uh, but um, would you, when you go to say Atlantic or Whistler or Sudbury are there specific things you're looking for uh, out of that festival or just a good screening just a good screening no it's 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 kind of nice well Ingrid knows it's nice to go back to those places you see the people like the I think most of the festival organizers are really you know they're doing it for the right reason so it's nice to just to reconnect and you sort of see the same traveling group from film festival to festival so it's n i don't really have expectations i mean um there's a big festival that we're we're, we're 
we're in. I can't announce it right now, but because it's being taped and there's Twitter, which I almost did and forgot. But you know, the, the the temptation is: do I need do I need to go there? It's you know, it's a 24-hour sort of travel to get there and stuff like that. So you're always just saying like, it's it's an economic decision. Is my time better spent four days at home or five days at home writing, or should I go to that film festival for the good of this film? So that's you're always wrestling with that. Is there? So just to get back to the question I was asking earlier, is there things you shouldn't expect from a festival? No, I think everybody, there's always a golden child at the film festival. And I think there's a reason we make these damn things, because we want to be that golden child. Like, you're all sitting there probably like I am thinking, okay, there are go this is going to just, this is it. And I think that's, I think that's, it's too hard to make films. There's way easier things to do in life. And if you don't sort of expect the, the best for, you know, or sort of dream of the best, then what the hell, why are you doing it? But, on the other hand, like I said, just also I'm, I'm trying to tell myself, just enjoy the experience for, you know, if they clap it into your screening, take it in and say, you know, I did something good rather than beat yourself up on all the other stupid stuff that you can. <laughs> Another, just on that, on that tip, will you watch all your screenings at TIFF? No, absolutely not. I will, uh, do you watch all yours, Ingrid? Yes, I do. Jesus, you're tough. <laughs> uh, I will watch the first one, and that'll be it. I'll never watch it again with an audience. I can't do it. I could just, it just, I don't know, I didn't, a mental case. I just watch the first one, and that's, and then I, can't, I make myself watch the first one, and, and I, I actually think I'll enjoy it this time, but maybe not. Uh, I just, because I just think they hate it, they hate it, they hate it. I just go to these bad places watching it, rather than, uh, and that'll be it. And then I'll, uh, I'll never watch it again. Um, yeah. Uh, there's yeah, next. Hello. Um, I was wondering, uh, do you try uh, to actually meet some of your peers? Do you try to, since... No, I, I hate my peers. I certainly... You do? <laughs> no. Uh, but do you try to take actually advantage of, you know, the fact that you're quite a well-known, you know, Canadian filmmaker, you've got the exposure, do you try to actually meet, you know, uh, your, your, your peers from the States or from Europe that are actually here as well for just a little time? Yeah, Sorry, I mean, that, you know, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, TIFF does a good job. We, you, they have the, the dinners and stuff like that, and they have the brunch and stuff like that, sort of where you do... I don't sort of try to meet people, but they do a good job of... I mean, my... They, there's some parties at TIFF, like, like the OMDC party and stuff like that. They're more... In, they're kind of the most fun for me, because you get to see everybody that from the industry that you... Like, in Canada, that you don't actually get to see, because there's not sort of some secret club that... You got everybody's excluded from except for a certain set. Like nobody really, uh, y you don't really see people all the time. So it's really nice to go to some of those sort of lower key parties and reconnect with people from from Canada. And then it's always great. I always so I, make, I always make time to go to the the dinners and the brunches just to to hear what other people are doing. But it's not like there's not sort of an agenda that you want to obviously that you want to take off or anything. Just to explain, we, 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 uh, all the programmers usually host a number of dinners for the filmmakers they programmed. Uh, and there's a brunch, which is kind of, I think, at least one. It's usually on the opening weekend, which is quite big. Uh, um, it might, there might be two, actually, uh, where you meet, um, uh, you know, where you're, where you're there with like 100, 150 other filmmakers or, uh, you know, 75 maybe. And then there's often... Uh, uh, directors' dinners, which are hosted by Cameron and peers, and those actually tend to be quite large too, about forty or fifty. But it's yeah, a good yeah. opportunity to meet people you wouldn't otherwise meet. Yeah, and they and I think TIFF does a good job. Even like they're from the they they spend time thinking about who's going to be at the table, so you're not. It's they, they you know they put the the short people with the feature people. Like it's just like they, I'm always sort of appreciative of the effort they, and I'm not just saying this because they put me in the festival again, but they, they do, they're, TIFF is unique in that way, that they're very filmmaker friendly in the sense of, yeah, it's nice to be at a table with sort of a variety, so you don't feel like, oh, there's the A table. Jesus, I'm really, that's a long <laughs> I'm way far away. away. I'm a long <laughs> way away from that table right now. No, we try to mix it up. Yeah, no, it's good, uh, it's really good. Um, right there? Yeah, do you find that you um, have to change the way you talk to people when you're trying to sell it, like to be some serial positivist, or like, uh, or, or are you free to be your kind of self-doubting, irreverent self, and oh. that doesn't hurt sales? Like, do you have to turn it on, so to yeah, speak? Yeah, you definitely have to turn it on. I mean, when you're, you know, when you do the media yesterday, so you find yourself, oh, this is my six-second television voice. Uh, 
but I, you we know, hear that. We should hear that again. Actually, you guys might want to hear the six second tell. Oh uh, yeah, still is a film of a eighty nine year old. No, um, the uh, but uh, no, I I just try to be fairly laid back because like like we're Canadian. Uh, it's I think over hyping it or trying to overhype yourself. People like there's just there's a listers that are coming in and that you're just it doesn't matter. Like I think like I'm excited for people to see my film i'm not trying to compete against you know the megawatt you know robert redford whoever's coming in and like we came in with saint ralph or, or you know we've come in a lot of times and sort of had this just nice experience that was so separate from the red carpet that it, i i think that you and i think that whoever you are low low key high key whatever i think it worked i mean like ingrid is a great example of somebody yeah, you know, you're always hustling, and you're you know you're supporting Canadian filmmakers. You're, we do it different ways, but I think we both try to be nice about it. Like I don't think we're, like, and I think you'll find that, I think I don't know Ingrid could tell me differently. I think the the filmmaking community is pretty darn nice for the most part in Canada. I mean, there's not. I don't know. People are nice, don't you think so? Uh, yeah, that's I mean, why I do the job. We're not going to name. There's some dickheads, but whatever. We don't. No, I haven't I mean, met any of those. No, actually. I haven't either. Obviously. <laughs> no, but I, it's not. I think it, like I think everybody struggles with. Will I work again? Will I make another film again? Will they like my film? All that kind of stuff. So there's enough. You get put down enough that if you've got a huge ego, you're just delusional. Like in terms of, we've all been beaten a bit by it but we've all had if you're lucky you've had some successes so I, if I, there's one piece of advice I'd say because I'm bad at this I'd say don't take the negative stuff too seriously like let it go like you're, you won't know what your film is you won't know the success of your film till a year or two after I, like a good friend of mine is Jennifer Batewell the documentary filmmaker and we sort of say it's a roller coaster that you don't really get off really until a couple of years later would you agree with that like it's sort of like if you sort of live and die by somebody on Twitter or, or all that kind of stuff, I just think it's unhealthy. It's just like let it play out over a long period of time rather than the minutia of it has to be right now. I guess. Would you say that, Ingrid? Yeah. yeah. I think that's an excellent piece of advice to end on, right, Andrew? I think so too. Oh, I think so too. Very well done. Excellent piece of advice. Yeah. All right. Thanks, thanks man. Thanks, Steve.